Okay. So, uh, how are we doing? Did you solve the Heroku debugging problems? Not yet. How are you guys doing with your tasks? You have the timer working? So you were working on a timer and on the delete rest Those method. Were. Was that? Those were. They, they were working on Heroku. Oh, okay. <laughs> so who, who is ready to talk a little bit about what they were doing? Okay. Yep, sure. I can plug you in on a GitHub, okay. GitHub and what's the rest of the URL? Um, if you go to the user tool look, I'm not sure how GitHub tool to look with with H T H O L O K ninety seven. Okay. And then uh, isn't it easier? Yeah. Yes. I can go from there. And then this one. Okay. And then you have to go to the dev branch. And subscriber uh, subscriber MongoDB. Subscriber MongoDB. This one? Yeah. Okay. So make it bigger. Okay. Do we want to describe it? Yeah. So So that's one way of doing it. It's one way because when you're registering a hook, the web hook for the um for the uh, trigger that is triggered by the conditions in the assignment tool, you have to return back the ID of the trigger, so then potentially the user who registered that webhook can delete it later or ref reference it, right? We, we, in the assignment, we said, that, well, we currently don't, you don't have to write the delete functionality, but you do have to have this functionality of returning the ID of that webhook. So to achieve that, that's one of the solutions. Yep. So in my add function, the add needs to return the ID, and it needs the way I did it. I did it as a hexadecimal uh, conversion of the ID in MongoDB. Uh, so it needs to be string, not int. And the subscriber, the S is a subscriber, and it has a uh, field ID that is not touched until now. And I set it equal to B sum generates an object ID for me, based on the based on stuff that makes it unique, the system, the clock and stuff like that. And then I insert it, and then I can just return this ID converted to hex. And then anytime I take an ID as parameter, I have to I have to remember that it's hex to convert it back. Yes, and there was some stuff I needed to have in my um, in my uh, struct to make it work. Excuse me, what is JSON? It's Bison. a binary JSON. It's an additional library inside the MGO, which handles the uh, binary representations of objects in the JSON format. And then uh, I don't know if I need this, but the post the Stack Overflow thing told me to add bson to not only have json but have bson also yes. than this so if i don't specify id it's omitted or something so yes that's yes. right so th this line is necessary because if you were to generate a, a subscriber without the id the um, id would be nil and then when you try to save it, it would kind of complain. And also when you're reading stuff, um, you, you need, so, so the underscore ID is the actual ID which the Mongo, the underlying Mongo is using, right? And what he's doing, he's mapping it to the struct, to a Golang struct. If you don't say omit uh, empty, that, that field would always be marshaled when you're saving into a dead DB, even if it's not, if it's, if it's not there, it would have a kind of a zero value, right? If it's a string, it would have an empty string. Um, 
and then you wouldn't be able to save an object because the Mongo would complain, say, an empty string is not a valid uh, representation of the object ID. So you need that second line uh, to, um, to make sure that it kind of works even if you're saving and letting the Mongo generate the ID. If you're always generating IDs manually, then you don't really need that. So in your case, if you're always generating IDs and only saving uh, subscriber objects with the ID fill, filled in, you're never really saving with, with empties, and then you don't need that provision. But just in, in case you want to let the Mongos uh, generate an ID, then you need that extra line. Um, and internally, the underscore ID is not a string. Internally, it is an object which has a, a bit of a structure. And then you can, it, it, the type is object ID. And then you can pass a converted back and forth from a hexadecimal value, and that's what we use because in the URL, when you want to refer to it or when you want to pass it as a JSON parameter, you know, hexadecimal a string is much more convenient. So that's what, that, that, that's a perfect solution, uh, the way he's doing it. Um, and you need this kind of a mapping between the underscore ID and your internal ID of your struct. Yeah. Great. Yep. Thank you very much. Yep. So that's, um, that's actually a recommended way of doing it, right? So the, the recommended way of doing it is that you use the um, uh, bison, um, bison um, package and you generate uh, the new ID yourself and you populate in your struct and before you save it, it's already there. So then you know what it is and you can pass it to whoever called you, right? So you know what the newly created subscriber uh, unique key is because you just have the reference to it. You just have a reference to it here. Uh, and then you convert it to a string. So what's the alternative? As I was explaining before, alternative is that you don't do that you have the omit on and on empty and then you don't have that line at all uh, and you're basically trying to save a subscriber uh, you try to save s without the id in and what mongo will do is would say oh yeah i have this new document which is a subscriber and the underscore id is missing so i will generate a new unique one for you and it will save your subscriber with this new id yeah Uh, that 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 is possible. Yes, so you have some sort of um, mechanisms internally to kind of prevent that to happen. Um, in the case of doing it on the server, um, yes, there is a risk of you get having kind of a perfect race condition. In which case, two items will try to save with the same ID. Um, you normally what you do is you normally um, will have an exception saying you cannot insert an object which has already ha have the underscore ID already in. So this will throw an error if that race happens, right? So if you're generating an ID yourself and it happens that you have two requests coming in trying to register a subscriber and you kind of happen to generate the ID at the same time with the same host and the same timestamp, then they might be the same, and the first one, which gets saved, will prevent the second one to, to happen. So here you will have an error, right? And he's catching that error in, potentially. OK, so what's the alternative? Alternative is um, there is a, a function on collection. So insert, unfortunately, um, returns an error only. It doesn't return us the newly generated ID of the object. Um, so what we can do is we can use a function called absurd. Uh, and the absurd um, has uh, two parameters, which is the what you want to modify and what you're modifying it with. And then it returns something called um, change info reference which happens to have the ID of the, um, the underscore ID of the field that you just modified, okay? 
So if I if I were to rewrite this code, um, yeah, let's kind of do do that quickly. So um, yeah, let's do it here. I will need to have another test method. No, maybe I just do it in Sublime. You just get the idea. I can make it bigger. So I have a, um, the original code and I'm using insert. Um, if I were to um, to convert it to use absurd, I would have also, uh, I would be returning error, but I will also be returning the change info. So I will be kind of um, returning a change info, which I then have this call done like this and I'm not my s doesn't have the my s doesn't have an ID attached to it so I would call s s um, whoops so if you if you see here what I need to pass is um, so upserted ID gives me the um, gives me the I, um, ID field uh, of the object that I just modified. And then I have two values, which is how many have been updated and how many have been removed. In my case, what should happen is I should have updated and removed, removed zero and updated um, one. So if I were, if I were to check, so C, Uh, yes, so upserted uh, ID will contain uh, the newly generated uh, ID of the object. Mm -hmm. um, and doing this uh, SS trick, if I go back. So, where is the upsert? Let me just check. Um, collection absurd yeah so you see here I have to have a selector what is a selector selector is um, a query which defines which objects will get modified right and then the um, update is the object which gets which has the data which is updated so The first solution which we discussed has this kind of a, a bit of a, a badness about it because we misusing the database key generation, right? This solution has a bit of badness about it because we abusing the absurd to do insert, right? What's the difference between absurd and the insert? Insert always creates a new object, right? And absurd will update the existing object if it already exists or insert a new object if the data doesn't match an existing object, right? What, so how, how does it work? Okay, let's say we have a, um, uh, this uh, subscriber webhook uh, collection and um, yeah, I don't, I don't know what uh, fields do you have. Um, yeah, what What is the what is the what's inside subscriber? What are the fields you have? Payload.go. Okay. So subscriber has a webhook URL, currencies and triggers, right? So let's say I have a, a webhook URL which says uh, slash localhost, okay? HTTP blah, 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 localhost, that's it. So if I, if I say I want to insert a new webhook uh, and I want to modify the base currency and the target currency, I can say I want to modify a particular subscriber with this particular ID and this particular uh, web webhook URL, I mean, using an ID is enough because it's a unique thing, right? But if I uh, have multiple um, 
multiple subscribers with the same uh, webhook but different base and uh, target currencies, uh, then what I can say, I, uh, I may want to update the base currency of the range of webhooks, right? So I can uh, modify a kind of more than one item. If I want to modify just one, I will use a kind of a unique selector. So the, the, the selector is the, uh, the query which defines either one or multiple items which then get updated by the second parameter. Does it make sense? So if I did what I did here, uh, when I said SS, it means I want to pick all the elements which have a particular webhook, particular currency, uh, base currency, particular target currency, and so on and so forth. And uh, remember, S, S doesn't have an ID. So S without uh, S id set so the s id is um is nil is not set right so I, I only matching by value and i go to look into my subscriber collection and i don't have any matching element i don't have an item which matches all those fields that i just populated which means i will have an insert which means i will have a new item in my collection now which matches matches s and then the re, uh, the returned Absorted ID will be the ID of that particular um, item, right? Um, what is a little bit um, confusing is that with the with the um, change info being returned for this call, um, I may have um, okay, so. I either modified one or multiple elements, right? So if I if I select it, if it just happened that I selected one element and I modified it, right? Um, I can have uh, change in for returning the one, the 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 ID of the modified element, right? But I can have more than one. I can have selector which selects multiple items and then I modified more than one in which case that is not an array that is just a single uh, ID of the one that I modified so the API is a little bit ambiguous of what happens when the absurd worked like an insert which it actually works this ID is returned here or when the absurd works like like an update in which case I would expect this to be an array because I can have more than one, right? Uh, but it, it doesn't. It only works, it only returns me the newly created ID or if, I'm, if, I've, if I've done an update that doesn't return anything and it only will have a value, oops, it will only have a kind of a uh, number of updated elements here. Yeah? Uh, I didn't quite understand that selection. So the selector works exactly the same way as a query. When you're doing find or find one, you're using a selector which, you know, um, matches some sort of query for you, right? So like in, in his case, uh, we have, yeah, let's, let, let me take this. So I have a reference to it. So, uh, if, uh, oops, that's not uh, this one here. So when I'm doing, um, yeah, let's um, let's say I have a collection which is this. And now I'm doing the absurd on the collection, but I can also do um, I can also do collection find right, and then I can have a bison um, um, and I can say uh, webhook URL is of particular type, so I can say HTTP whatever localhost something 
right? So what what is this? This is like a JSON JSON struct which constrained the query to find, right? Um, so the same happens here. You can basically uh, have um, uh, you could rewrite S into the into that format and have kind of the the query you know uh, constraints done as a first parameter. Um, but you know it's much easier to do SS um, than to be generating the the query like this. Um, if I if I had S with only um, because you, you can you can do queries by wildcards or you can do queries by matching. If it was a student and I was looking for students who are uh, 22 years old, I can have one field saying age, right? And then if I have one field saying age, um, and then I would say <coughs> 22, then what this means is it matches every student who is 22 years old, right? I cannot do I cannot do um, um, so now if, if I did this if I have yeah let's let's just imagine that I have a student uh, and I have uh, age and name uh, fields right um, if I do student um, age equals 22 and then instead of this I did student it's the same query right I'm looking for students who match particular pattern um, so the selector here is basically like this is like the the kind of a query selector which you would use in a query um, and it just happened to be unique enough that it only matches one one item because there actually is one item that I Yes, okay. yeah, yeah. That's what we're doing here. We we sending s, which is like a object. Yeah. Yep. No. Um, the the only reason why you adding bison here is to have this property, right? If you want any of those fields to be ignored, if you're saving the data struct with not that field in, if you want it to be ignored, then you have to do this bison thing. Like, we don't have omit empty on, on JSON. You only have omit empty on bison. So that's kind of a nuisance, right? Um, in fact, because you've already did this, technically you don't need this because it maps to the underscore ID because of the bison annotation. Yeah. So what will happen if you have, um, you know, target currency and empty string? It will save into the a database uh, a target currency empty string, right? Even though it's kind of empty. Um, so if you want not to have a target currency at all, if it's empty, because you have like a system where the, no, let, let's say, base currency by default using euro, right? So if you have a webhook which doesn't have base currency you assume it's euro okay but then if you save something without base currency in your uh, subscriber on on your goal space mongo will still like the the driver will still save something with that empty string and if you want to avoid it then you would have to have this for the base currency with uh, omit empty right yeah all right it was a lot of hand waving like i didn't do a good explanation of the absurd but that's the alternative way of obtaining the ID of the newly inserted element. Whether you use the absurd or whether you use the way he is doing it, it doesn't matter. His way is simpler. Um, but as he pointed out, you may have a race condition that it, in a busy system where multiple things are happening very um, um, frequently, you may have this line of code generating the same ID because it is based on a timestamp. Like if if two things happen up to a millisecond at the same time, you may have a collision. Well, can't you just add uh, like have a container stump that you add and then do model on, so you continuously add something? But those things happen concurrently. 
So your logic of adding something is the same as this logic in the concurrent thread. So you yeah, still may have a collision. Yeah, yeah, but you, the first one that does it will add that value. So you have a value stored, and you take that value as a base and then does something to it and then stores it. Exactly. So, so now you have something in the database which says the current value is 100. And you have two threads reading it at the same time, and they read 100. And they say, yeah, add one to it, we add one to it. And you end up with 101. And the first one which updates it. Don't you end up with 102 then? If it was 100 and both the threads adds one to it? No, because when you read, it was 100 to, both, to two threads. Ah, right. Right. So, so one, write, one writes 101, and then one overwrites 101 with 101. Okay. Exactly, yes. That, that's <laughs> that's <laughs> It's a race condition, exactly. So that's why we want to delegate all these race conditions to a database. Like, we don't want to deal with that. We want the database management system to deal with that, right? Isn't it extremely improbable and it doesn't matter that much if it happens because you just got an error? Exactly. Then try again. Yes, exactly. So, so currently what is happening here is, um, uh, where was it? Here. What we are doing is we trying to do best effort service and then in case it fails, we just have an error which goes back and with, it just says, okay, your, your uh, subscriber webhook registration failed to retry, right? Uh, document all resources. Yeah, exactly. So, so in, in his case, there is no logical problem. Like what? It's very unlikely that it will happen, and if it happens, it basically fails to register the webhook and says, yeah, try again, like, you know, retry. Yeah? And my question is, how do I differentiate, uh, how do I return document over the exists error, and how do I return fail to dial Mongo? You will have a different error. <laughs> so the, the error will be different for, um, oh, yeah. 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 I'm not going to make it myself. So I don't do that yeah, exactly. Okay, so that was the, it took us a while, it's already one o'clock, and we only covered the, uh, this one. Oh well, we can done. But, was that? That's good. I mean, we have one done, <laughs> which was the most impactful one. Um, so we will reconvene here at uh, four o'clock, yeah. and we will, um, yeah, so I, I already have the uh, the marshalling code as well, so I can show you how to do this for arbitrary, uh, you know. Um, if, your, if your JSON is a well-structured, if the key and values are, if the values are of known type, and if the keys are known in advance, you can have a struct, which basically you parse into, right? And that's the easiest way to do it. Uh, but sometimes what happens is you have... Uh, the type of the key value unknown in advance, and it, sometimes it um, it changes. Like uh, some of the values are integers, and some of the values are strings, right? And you need to differentiate it when you're parsing it. Um, or the keys are not known in advance. You may have an arbitrary array of different keys that fixer returns. So sometimes it may have extra currency or the currencies that you don't know in advance, right? Um, and then you need to do the parsing kind of semi-manually. So I, I can show you at four o'clock how, how to do it. I will commit it to the uh, to the student DB GitHub repo so you, you see the example. Um, and then this we can discuss as well, although this is kind of good enough for maybe a lecture, yeah. yeah. So maybe we can discuss it like on Monday, briefly, yeah. And then these three are easy. We can do them at four as well. Um, yeah. They are very practical right now. Yeah. Again, this one, it's super important, but I think there is not much we can talk about it. Like debugging on Heroku sucks <laughs> big time. Okay, you can check your logs, and you can uh, check the errors. Um, but they kind of of limited utility. They, there is no debugging. You have to just do print, print, print outs into the log 
and just check the logs. That's all there is. Like, that's how I do it, right? If there is a better way of doing it, I would like to know about it, but I don't know if there is. I didn't find anything either. You just read the log and try to make sense of it. Exactly, yeah. When you can't make sense of it, you Google it, and when you can't find good answers, you cry. Uh, well, if I can't make sense of the logs, I do more printouts. I kind of more detailed printouts of what is doing, what is happening in my app, right? So then the logs printouts are more detailed and they help me more. Yeah? There is also important to like, yeah, maybe mention that you can also, like maybe test, do most of the testing on the Heroku local first. That's right, yes. Before you deploy even more yeah. parameters, so you make sure it's that stable in Heroku local. Exactly. Before you take the step. So, so the, basically paraphrasing it is to try and make sure your app doesn't need debugging on Heroku. Yeah. <laughs> right? If you have to do debugging on Heroku, you probably did something wrong earlier. So try to debug it beforehand and only debug on Heroku things that are Heroku specific. And most of the time it's about your environmental variables, right? So if you, are, if you have an app perfectly debugged and working locally, and then it kind of doesn't work on Heroku, 99% of the time, or 99.9, .9, it's about your environmental variables. You're screwing up something with your environmental variables. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, that, you know, there is not much I can tell you. It's just that there is uh, two commands. So there is a Heroku uh, logs, which is useful for browsing the logs. And there is also Heroku um, apps error or oh, errors. I don't remember. Let me just check quickly. If I go to, yeah, so Heroku logs is just the normal one. And um, is it errors? No, apps errors. Yeah. So it is apps errors. As, as indicated here. So if you, where, where is it? Yeah, so those two commands are kind of the most useful, uh, but again, they are of limited uh, utility, right? Uh, the errors are quite useless, actually. I just tells you, I have crashed, you know, 20 times. <laughs> um, the logs are kind of useful, but it depends how much you you logging, how much you printing out to the to the logs. Uh, so then, if it's not informative enough, you just go to your code and add more printouts. Um, all right, so we we kind of have those two covered. Although we didn't really solve the debugging on Heroku, try to avoid it. Like try to write tests and try to debug your app on local. Uh, and only deploy when you're sort of confident that it, it should work. Um, and then if you do need to do debugging, yeah, you, you kind of have to do local debugging. So we will do those three uh, at four, and this one at four. And um, some of the things like the object-oriented metaphor, uh, we will do on Monday in the class in the lecture. All right, so see you at, at four.